and boom. Dr. Jones, how's it going, sir? Can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. Very cool. Very cool. It's good to have you back here on the program. We were sorting through our own little um, uh, technical issues here, which sometimes happens, but uh, it worked out really well. How you been doing lately? Good. Good. Just had my 23rd grandchild. Wow. Okay. Put another one on the board. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty high number right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 23. Wow. Yep. Well, congratulations. I'll say that. You're welcome. And keep it going. Uh, now, for those who don't know, Dr. Anz is here as well. Um, I believe he's a doctor. He might as well be. He's a genius anyway. So uh, if he's not, I'm going to give him <laughs> I'm gonna give him his doctorate. I'm afraid uh, not. <laughs> okay, you're not. I think we may have had this conversation before uh, now that I think about it. But uh, you both are here. Uh, since uh, E. Michael Jones, I was just talking to him. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience a little bit? I always do that at the beginning just for those who don't know you or whatever. Me? Yeah. Okay. Uh I'm the uh, editor of Culture Wars magazine. I've been doing that for over 40 years. Uh, I just had my 23rd grandchild. Uh, I've written a number of books, uh, the most recent being uh, The Holocaust Narrative. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, I'm grateful to be here. Also grateful to Ron Unz for uh, creating his platform. Uh, we ha I posted an article there. So uh, great to be here with, with Ron as well. Uh, yes, and I was really excited to put this together, uh, to have you both here at the same time. Uh, Ron Unz, why don't you give us a little short intro uh, yourself, although he mentioned uh, your publication there, but uh, just a little short rundown. Sure. Well, I'm originally a theoretical physicist by technical training, but for the last um, 30, 35 years, I've really been involved in computer software and more recently in public policy issues. So I have a website, The Unz Review, which focus, which really is intended to provide sort of a convenient platform for the interesting, controversial, important ideas that are excluded from the mainstream media. And so, you know, we have a wide range of different views, left-wing, right-wing, libertarian, all sorts. And I've, you know, done really quite a lot of writing myself over the last five or six years on some of these various controversial issues. Now, we're here tonight, uh, this, you know, of course, we can go into a few different things, um, but kind of my idea for one of the main thrusts of the conversation was uh, basically Zionist control of the media and its role in the Palestinian genocide. Um, and I can let you start there, uh, uh, Mr. Ons, if you'd like, uh, and then we can go on to E. e. Michael Jones. Um, first off, do you accept that premise uh, that the media is Zionist controlled, and do you think it's uh, contributed to the genocide we've seen in Gaza? Well, I, I, I certainly think pro-Israel Zionist groups have a tremendous amount of influence over the media. I, I don't know if I'd say absolutely controlled, but I mean, certainly sure. they're extremely influential. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the fact that, uh, I mean, really what, what's going on right now in Gaza is probably, you know, the worst televised massacre of helpless civilians in the history of the world. I mean, you know, there's certainly been much larger massacres, but they've occurred out of sight, out of mind, right. you know, many times in rural situations or, you know, decades or centuries ago. And, you know, all of this because of the social media platform is being broadcast live to the entire world, you know, with tens of thousands of helpless Palestinian civilians having been massacred. And, you know, the fact that, for example, for all the, um, the politically correct rhetoric of the United States and its allies over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, criticizing any country in the world that does anything, you know, steps over the line in any sort of way. I mean, the fact that we're actively involved in supporting this gigantic massacre that everybody in the world is seeing on their social media feeds is just, you know, a tremendous blow, I think, to American credibility, prestige, and I, I think, you know, could be really almost the mark of doom for the state of Israel. Because, I mean, the thing is, uh, Israel has sort of survived over the last 60 or 70 years, partly because it's received such a positive treatment in the Western media. And, you know, in a sense, I mean, I, I think probably many or most of us, you know, grew up with that sort of attitude sure. towards Israel. And the fact that now billions of people around the world are seeing that the reality is so much different, and they're seeing it on their smartphones, on their computers, you know, while the traditional media is still broadcasting nonstop lies and distortions of what's going on, I think will cause many of these people to begin questioning many other things that have been told by the media. 
And once those cans of worms are open, I, I think the results for the state of Israel may be extremely negative down the road. Uh, now go ahead, Dr. Jones. You can pick it up from there on that same topic. Yeah, I think we have an unprecedented situation here. Uh, the uh, uh, Obviously, what, what was just said, that, that's true. Uh, but uh, I think we have an unprecedented situation among the Jews themselves. Uh, and the most the best instance of this that I can think of is the uh, acceptance speech that uh, Jonathan Glazer gave uh, for his movie, uh, the, the Zone of Interest. Now, the Zone of Interest is a Holocaust movie. Okay, and I've written a lot about Holocaust movies. Uh, it's a kind of interesting uh, 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 addition to that genre. Uh, but uh, the premise of this movie is that uh, the Hearst, it's uh, Rudolf Hearst and his family living right on the other side of the wall of Auschwitz and pretending that they're not uh, uh, knowing what's going on. Well, there was a wall there, and I don't care what you say, most people did not know what went on in Auschwitz. Whatever it was, they didn't know it because of the media technology of the time. Well, what's the analogy here? The analogy is that the United States is exactly in that position. We are all, as Americans in the entire world, like Rudolf Hoss and his, and his wife, ignoring the genocide that, that, that's going on. Now, this is unprecedented, and even more unprecedented was the, uh, the, accept the acceptance speech. So, of course, uh, it's a terrible movie. Uh, you, of course, you win an Oscar <laughs> because it's a Holocaust film. Okay, right. you know that's, that's going to happen. That's how it works. Yeah. Okay, but, so, but the surprise is when he comes up to give his acceptance speech, he says, right now we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. What does that mean? You, you refute your Jewishness? I've, I've never heard anyone say that before. And I think that this is the, 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 this is the crisis that the Jews are going through right now. And I think that's important because I think you're right. I think the Jews do control the, the media. But the question is, what's controlling the Jews right now? Uh, you're seeing mass defections from the Jewish narrative in places like uh, Columbia University, for example, a huge crisis, a free speech crisis now at, at universities uh, because no one can seem to uh, accommodate both sides of this of this discussion anymore, thanks to the uh, identity politics and so on and so forth. So you're seeing basically the, the Holocaust narrative now uh, being brought back and applied to the Jews themselves or the Americans themselves or whatever. And now the Jews feel they have to refute their Jewishness, whatever that means. Yeah. I, what do you think about the speech law aspect? We talked about the Columbia thing today ad nauseum. If you look in the political news, that's almost all these uh, elected politicians are talking about this crisis at Columbia. There's some set in by some pro-Palestinian group or whatever. By the way, this is an accepted form of protest on, on college campuses since, I don't know, the 60s and was basically pioneered by Jews <laughs> in a lot of ways, uh, right? Like uh, some of these protesters early uh, were Jewish protesters. But regardless, now it's the crime of the century uh, and now we need to take the police in there to break them up. Where do you see this thing headed? I'll, I'll continue with Jones and then take it to, to Mr. Unz. Yeah, it was Mark Rudd. Remember Mark yeah. Rudd? That iconic photo of him there with a big cigar and his sunglasses yeah. sitting at the desk of the uh, the wasp who was running Columbia at the time, you know? Yeah, yeah that was that was okay. Every, that, every, no one had any problem with that, but now the situation has gotten out of control. So the question is, uh, the, big, the big issue facing us right now, like Ron and me, is the fact that uh, the United States is getting ready to pass a censorship bill. Uh, basically, Bipartisan bill, Bill uh, 4091, or the Counter Anti Semitism Act, sponsored by Democrat Jackie Rosen of Nevada Republican Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. Now, this, I know where this bill came from. If you remember one year ago, uh, D Debbie Lipstadt, who's part of Biden's minion, okay, for the 457 Jews that run the Biden administration, issued the most comprehensive plan to fight anti-Semitism in the history of the United States. 
Now, if you read that document, the first thing you saw in bold letters at the top was, this does not have the rule, uh, have the status of the rule of law. This does not contradict any law or the Constitution, i.e. the First Amendment. Well, guess what? <laughs> now it does. Now they want to, the ADL is going to introduce this as the rule of law. And if you say anything that a Jew doesn't like, now you go to jail. So this is this is why this is uh, important. This is, I think, why we have to come together and talk about it right now. Now, what do you think about that, Mr. Ons? Uh, and that is something that, uh, that we definitely wanted to talk about. And just the overall push you can see is criminalization of, of critiquing Zionists, basically, in my opinion. Well, I mean, there certainly is an effort in that direction. And I'll be honest, I really hadn't been aware of that legislation. And, you know, I, I, you know obviously it's probably been excluded from the media, but it seems to me it would have very, if what you're saying accurately describes it, I think it would have a very difficult time surviving legal challenge. I mean, what are the provisions in there? And how does it get around the First Amendment? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't I, think it does get around the First Amendment, but I, I don't know what Dr. Jones read the whole bill. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. So <laughs> maybe, maybe what we're seeing here is the Congress is totally controlled by IPAC. We, we know that. Okay, so maybe they're just saying, okay, we'll approve it, but we know it's going to be overturned by the Supreme Court. Maybe, maybe that's the strategy here. I, I think it just would be very difficult to pass something like that. And now, you know, obviously, European countries and many other countries around the world do have, you know, very restrictive speech laws, and people can get sent to prison for, you know, saying something that certain groups don't like. But I, I think it would be very difficult for something like that to survive in the United States. Now, uh, is, is it actually up for a vote in Congress? Has it been passed by either of the houses? Or is it just sort of something that they're talking about to try to you know, wrangle donations from the groups that support it? This is a report from uh, CNN, April 10th, 2024. Uh, the Jonathan Greenblatt described the bill as the most far-reaching anti-Semitism initiative ever to be introduced to Congress. The group said it is launching a campaign to get congressional support for the bill's passage. That, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's where it stands as of uh, April 10th. Uh, what exactly does it criminal? Uh, in other words, it actually puts in place criminal penalties for criticizing Israel or criticizing Jews or making public statements? I, I mean, what are the provisions in the bill? Well, uh, I don't know because I haven't read it. I'm just oh. reading, I'm reading you the, the, uh, the news report that uh, took place, uh, happened about 10, uh, two weeks ago. So I, ha I have not read the bill, but I'm saying uh, it sounds like that basically the codification, the legal codification of that camp, uh, comprehensive program to fight anti-Semitism that got passed by the Congress in May. And that basically mobilizes the entire government, including the Department of Agriculture, including the Forest Service, uh, to combat anti-Semitism. Now it's going to have the rule of law. Now they're going to be able to, uh, well, uh, as I said, I haven't read the complete bill, uh, and I don't know what penalties are. But there are state bills. Yes, okay? that's what I was going to bring up, actually, the state the, this, bills. There are state this, bills. Yes. Chris, Christy Nome, there are 357 Jews in South Dakota, and now they you can't criticize them because of Christy Nome's bill. Ron DeSantis' bill is, is something similar yeah. to this. Texas. We had we had a uh, uh, we have a bill pending in the Indiana State Legislature uh, that is uh, based on the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism, which is a uh, a certain perception. <laughs> Good luck on that one, uh, making that a law. But uh, that, so the governor vetoed the bill, and I thought, oh, great, great. Finally, someone's standing up for the people of Indiana. No, he vetoed it because it didn't go far enough. And he wanted examples of anti Semitism, specific examples of anti Semitism. Uh, and I don't know what they would be, but it's probably something like uh, accusing Israel of genocide or something like that that type of thing, because that's already been banned on college campuses uh, in places like Florida. I mean, they're certainly putting a lot of pressure. You know, a lot of these groups are certainly exerting a lot of pressure in areas that they uh, can have influence. So, you know, just as you said, I mean, the fact that, for example, they were able to grill those three elite university presidents in that congressional hearing, 
and force the resignation of two of them very quickly afterwards. I mean, that certainly put you know the fear of God into all these other university presidents. And in fact, if you saw what happened uh, just a few days ago with the Columbia University president, I mean, the fact that she was so worried about following the path of those other individuals who were kicked out meant that she called in the police and had those demonstrators arrested. But I, I'm still skeptical whether you know any effort like this could survive legal challenge you know, outside private organizations like university campuses. Now, uh, th actually, you've raised a good point. I, mean, I, I certainly read something about these state bills being passed, but I assume they've been challenged in court. In other words, for example, I, I, what is it, in Texas or a few other states right now, you have to almost take an oath of allegiance yes. to supporting Israel to get any sort of government contract or something I like that? I know at least yeah. one teacher was fired in Texas. I don't know the outcome of her appeals or anything like that, but she was fired under that law. Or she was pro-Palestinian. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I think part of it is, you know, the, the fact that these steps are being taken, I think, shows how worried these organizations Absolutely. are about the tremendous wave of popular um, popular agitation that's coming up against their position. So I, I really think what they're doing is more a sign of weakness rather than a sign of strength. And, you know, when you look at, for example, all these demonstrations, I mean, you know, when you look at the polling numbers right now that show, I, I think for uh, Americans under the age of about 40 or something like that, there's roughly a 50-50 split between support for Israel and support for the Palestinians, I mean, which would have just been unthinkable 20 or 30 years ago. And it's all because of social media, and that's obviously the reason that they're trying to ban TikTok, because TikTok is a relatively uncensored platform that allows people to voice their feelings on these things. So I, I really I am pretty skeptical whether these particular state laws will, you know, have the sort of severe effect some people think they might. Though, you know, again, I mean, they certainly could. And, you know, what actually happened, I know, in a number of European countries is efforts were made to sort of criminalize what they regard as anti-Semitism for decades before they finally succeeded. I, I think, for example, in Britain, probably Jewish groups spent 20 or 30 years, maybe even 40 years, trying to pass group libel laws unsuccessfully. And then finally, I think about 20, 25 years ago, they, they were able to get it through by bundling it with a lot of other uh, sort of anti-racist provisions. So, you know, it could be that maybe in the United States, they'll finally somehow get around these First Amendment provisions. But I really think it would be very difficult. And what makes it especially difficult, again, is that the tide of public opinion is running so strongly in the other direction. In other words, th they're facing, I think, a very much uphill battle to basically clamp down on something that has so much popular support right now. Now, what do you no. think about that, Dr. Jones? Go ahead. I, I agree. I agree. It's an uphill battle. But, but, let's, let's, let's put that aside. Let's try to contextualize that. That's the legal angle. Uh, what we have in addition to this is lawfare, Jewish lawfare. Uh, there, I, I played a clip on one of my podcasts of uh, Alan Dershowitz. Uh, saying that, uh, well, I'm going to create a firm with 100 lawyers and we're going to go after anti-Semites and any and anybody we don't like, he's going to be sleeping on the sidewalk by the time we get done with him. Well, that's a, that's a serious issue. And, and in many ways, I'd rather be tried by the government, according to the Constitution, than tried by uh, Alan Dershowitz and his thugs. This, this is uh, what we need to do with the Internet is nationalize it which is to say make the rule of law the law of the Internet as well, rather than the rule of the ADL or whatever group that comes in and exerts pressure on, on these platforms uh, like Google. That, that's, what has, that's what has to happen. So in many ways, I, I, it would be a good development. But on the other hand, like let's look at what happened to Harvard. What happened? The big Jewish donors uh, said, honey, you're, you're out of here, and she left. And that set a chilling effect throughout that. And what the net result of this is you guys broke it. There was a modus vivendi here where groups could get together and express their views, and the Jews broke it. They were the ones, the, the, the big donors at Harvard were the ones that basically put her on the line. And now how are you going to regulate this? And that, I think that's the situation we're seeing in Colombia. After you guys broke it, now how are we going to do it? Do we have to call the cops every time someone protests? 
this this is the kind of so I agree with you. There's probably going to be problems constitutionally with this thing. But on the other hand, it keeps rolling in the same direction because these e elites uh, simply can't, these elite groups, institutions simply can't say no to Jewish power. Well, I mean, certainly, you know, Jews are a very influential group, but it just seems to me that when you look at, for example, the geopolitical developments right now, I, I think, you know, in a very short period of time, there may be such severe geopolitical disasters for the West and for the United States that I think a lot of that power may end up dissipating. I mean, take for example, there seems to be a very good possibility that Russia may win the Ukraine war later this year. And in effect, what Russia has done has been to defeat NATO, de defeat the combined force of NATO because of you know all the NATO weapons, all the materials sent to the Ukrainians. And so, you know, for NATO to have been defeated by Russia because of you know America provoking a war against the Russians the way we did, I mean, would be a gigantic geopolitical disaster for the United States. In the same way, you know, as far as I can tell, based on the military analysts I've been following, I mean, the Iranians sent a very, very powerful message with their huge missile and um, drone bombardment of Israel in retaliation for that attack on the embassy. And I mean, the whole geopolitical situation in the Middle East is also shifting dramatically against America and Israel. So, you know, when you're looking at the combination of those factors, I mean, it, you know, the one thing that I think makes should make all of us very nervous is both the United States and Israel contain nuclear weapons arsenals. In other words, if not for the existence of nuclear weapons, I think both the United States and Israel would be in a very, very difficult situation in the Middle East and in Europe and in other parts of the world. And, you know, if America is defeated, because of its incredibly aggressive actions over the last few years. I mean, that's such a tremendous blow to American dominance, to American prestige, that you could easily see a lot of people looking for some group or individuals to blame. And, you know, with the, for example, with the neocons having controlled American foreign policy for the last 30 years, 30, 35 years, I mean, they would obviously be the group that would be targeted. And so, you know, it just seems to me that I mean, some of these local events taking place, I mean, people passing certain laws or, you know, even Harvard or some of these universities backing down in the face of, you know, donor protests. I mean, if some of these broader disasters take place, I, I think there may be a lot of very, very angry people around. And, you know, many of these individuals taking those extreme positions would have made themselves tremendous targets for that sort of popular backlash. And I mean, right now, for example, I, I think the figures I've seen are something like a third, maybe in 40% of Americans are very dissatisfied with America's support for Israel and its you know, massive bombardment of Gaza. I mean, it might be even closer to 50% now. And you know, the, the fact that, for example, there's none of the three main presidential candidates, two or three main presidential candidates, is willing to take that position shows the stranglehold the mainstream media and these, you know, huge financial donors have over the political system. But I, I think it's a very fragile stranglehold if 50% or 45% of the American public is on the other side, despite decades of massive propaganda. So I, I just think, you know, all the things you're saying are certainly true, but I, I think the hold these groups have over American society is extremely fragile right now. No. Just like, for example, the dominance that America and its allies has in Europe or in the Middle East is very fragile. Now, let me pick up there with Dr. Jones. He, he talks about it being a, a fragile stranglehold. I don't really disagree. I agree with that. Uh, but might that fragility um, be the cause of some of this overreach, right, or even further That's right. Uh, overreach, right? Like, this is it, and we got to crack down. We have one or two more chances to crack down, and if we don't go all the way with it, we're effed, right? Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Right. I think that's exactly the point. I mean, if you look at the film uh, Untergang, the most dangerous time to be a German soldier in Berlin was right before the end, where these <laughs> SS groups are running around shooting people. So the, the good German soldier will say, Heil Hitler, and then they shoot him. You know, Fahnenflug, okay? So it's really dangerous right now, and, and really dangerous. And our job here is to identify who's responsible. And my fear is that people are going to say, well, it's America. No, it's not America. 
It's the people who took over our foreign policy. I, you know, Ron, you mentioned the neoconservatives. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I agree with you. But at this point, neoconservative has become uh, a euphemism for Jew. It's a word that people say when they don't want to say the word Jew. And as a result, uh, what are we going to say? Is Anthony Blinken a neoconservative? Uh, no, he's a liberal. So we have to, first of all, we have to recognize the danger of the moment right now this is the most dangerous time available and I, I i love the way you have that kind of pan glossy and long view of how it's all going to turn out right and i hope it does i mean i have faith that god is in charge of human history and i pray that it will turn out right but right now we have a real specific issue that we got to deal with and we simply have to identify who's responsible for this it's 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 victoria newland it's 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 Paul Wolfowitz. It's the, the Jews took over our foreign policy. They have ruined it. They have brought us to the brink of nuclear war, and we have to hold them responsible. And we have to draw certain conclusions from this. Well, I mean, one thing that I've sometimes made a point of tried to make in my articles is that, you know, back 25, 30 years ago, people talked about neocons because, you know, they were a political faction, a powerful political faction in the D.C. establishment, foreign policy establishment. But, you know, despite the disaster of the Iraq war and a lot of the other disasters they fomented, the neocons became so powerful, they took over the entire foreign policy establishment of the United States. So in other words, the reason people don't use the term neocon much these days is because pretty much everybody in D.C. foreign policy circles is a neocon. I mean, you know, certainly the early neocons were overwhelmingly Jewish, but then, you know, we have, for example, Pompeo, we have Bolton, we have so many people in the Trump administration who were very much in that orbit. You know, I mean, in fact, Dick Cheney was regarded as a neocon. And so, you know, in a sense, the entire political establishment of D.C. these days is represented by what might be considered a merger of the neocon and neoliberal establishments of 25 years ago. So in other words, the reason you don't use the term is that everybody's a neocon. I mean, you know, fish don't see water because that's fish right. Don't notice water because it's wet. And, and so, you know, I mean, the whole thing about it is, I think if a foreign policy disaster takes place, I mean, let me use an extreme example. Over the last 10 years or so, the Russians have developed a very powerful new strategic technology of hypersonic missiles. And the Chinese have them, even the Iranians have them. I mean, these are very, you know, revolutionary technological development. America has been unsuccessful in building hypersonic missiles. I mean, we spend a trillion dollars a year going to these corrupt defense contractors, and we can't build hypersonic missiles. Because of that, uh, America's strategic deterrent is very vulnerable right now. I mean, I'll give you an example. And again, if not for nuclear weapons, it would be the easiest thing in the world. We have right now, over the last couple of years, we've provided the missiles, the targeting technology, everything the Ukrainians needed to sink many of the Russian ships in the Black Sea fleet. We sunk their flagship, we've sunk a number of their other vessels. I think the Russians would be very eager to return the favor. And with their hypersonic missiles, they could destroy any of our aircraft carriers. In other words, a few months ago, we sent two of our aircraft carrier groups to the Middle East to support Israel. The Russians would have had a very easy time simply announcing that they think those aircraft carriers should not be in the region, urge them to leave. And if they didn't leave, they could sink them, they could send them to the bottom of the ocean. There's nothing we could do to stop that. The Russians could declare that, you know, noon three days from now, they will fire a warhead to destroy NATO headquarters in Europe. And there's no defense NATO or any of our anti-missile systems could have against that. So it would be very easy for the Russians to take those steps and completely destroy America's global deterrent, probably sink the dollar. The only reason they wouldn't do something like that is that they know the American regime is irrational and dangerous enough to very likely resort to nuclear weapons if something like that happened. In other words, we have a very you know, irrational, dangerous, reckless government, and it controls thousands of nuclear warheads. I mean, that's really the danger right now. And the same thing is also true of Israel. For example, a number of people have really pointed out that when you look at what happened with the Hamas attack, I mean, they basically overran and defeated some of Israel's premier elite military units in straight up battle in the field. I mean, right now, a number of other countries in the region, I mean, the Turkish army is large and powerful and conventional forces. Other armies are fairly large. They could probably easily defeat and overrun Israel. They could basically 
send their troops there, defeat the Israeli army, and conquer the country. The only reason they would never do something like that, aside from the possibility of American intervention, is because Israel has nuclear warheads. And the Israeli government is crazy enough to use them in, you know, as the result of any sort of conventional defeat. And so, you know, it's really the nuclear weapons that make things difficult, if not for that. I mean, if the Russians sank a couple of our carrier groups or the Chinese did, I think what we could see in America would be a collapse of the dollar, a collapse of global prestige for the United States. And, you know, people would then say, well, why were we spending a trillion dollars a year on the military, more than almost every other country in the world combined? if our military forces were so easily defeated. And I think what we would see in the United States might very well be the equivalent of a 1905 revolution against a corrupt ruling regime that showed itself to be militarily incapable. The only reason that can't happen is because of nuclear weapons. And nobody around the world wants a nuclear war. And nobody wants, you know, something like that to happen. So, I mean, that's really all that I, I think is sort of keeping America you know, on top these days, the fact that we have an irrational government that possesses five or 6,000 nuclear warheads. All right, go ahead, Dr. Johns. Also, I have the bill. I'll skim through that and read out a few provisions out of this bill here in a minute, too. Uh, but go ahead, Dr. Johns, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, well, that's you're right. I agree about the nuclear weapons. I agree about the obsolete technology that the United States has. Okay, but uh, uh, we have to again talk about agencies, agency here. Who is the actor here? And I'm saying we have to talk about the Jews who got us into this mess. Because if there's a crisis, okay, there, there probably will be a crisis coming along. We have to identify who's responsible. Now, I am not I'm talking about removing people like this from power. We have to address this issue. So I'm, you, you brought up the Dick Cheney and so on and so forth. I agree with that. Okay. He's not a Jew. But I'm, I would like to talk about Bolshevism. Bolshevism, uh, was every Bolshevik a Jew? No. Was Stalin a Jew? No. Was it a Jewish political movement? Yes, it was. And this was the form. And the form is important because they created the form. This is the Jewish revolutionary spirit. I wrote a really big book about this thing, trying to identify the issue. And when you join the organization, you conform to the form. And that's precisely the problem. And my fear is it will get lost in all this discussion and suddenly, wait a minute, uh, oh, they're, they're not here anymore. We're not talking about the people who, who created this problem in the first place. If we survive, we may not survive because of, the, because of Victoria Nuland, because of all of these people who have brought us to the brink of nuclear war. We cannot ignore this problem. We are not out of the woods yet. I hope and pray that we do get out of the woods, but we have to have some type of accountability here. So you've got the, a lot of people, thanks to the new media, who are now able to identify the problem. At some point, some politician is going to have to step forward and represent this group of American people. And so far, this has not happened. There was a time when America had an anti-Masonic party. Sounds weird now. I mean, what, what's the problem with those guys on their go karts and fezes and stuff like that? <laughs> but that's the that's Shire not what it, yeah. that's not what it was at that point. It was something completely different. And I'm saying right now we need an anti-Jewish party. We need a party that says these are the people that have caused the problem. We have to deal with this in a humane but effective way, because if we do not, if they keep shutting down this discussion, violence is going to be the answer. And that's the the, the, the great point that uh, well, in that book that I posted, the review of his book, uh, La Défaite de l'Occident, the French book, which I posted on your, on your site. This is when the form, he says, the empire is collapsing. That's true. Why is it collapsing? Because Protestantism is the, uh, hidden grammar of the empire and Protestantism has evaporated. I think that's true as well. And when the form disappears, there's violence. That is the threat right now. The form is disappearing and violence is going to be the result. One of the great ge genius strokes he had in that was the, the uh, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Norway, uh, uh, Finland even. Well, th these are, these are the uh, textbook examples of neutral countries when 
Lutheranism evaporated in these countries, they joined NATO. <laughs> and now they're, they're the biggest warmongers in, in, in Northern Europe. This is, this is precisely what we have to face up to right now so that we can get through this crisis. So I really think a lot of it is probably due more to media control than anything else. In other words, you know, again, I, I don't know the details of these individual Scandinavian countries, but I think one of the factors involved is that 30 or 40 years ago, they weren't as totally dominated by the American global media as they have been, you know, since the end of the Cold War in the last couple of decades. In other words, you know, with the main Internet and with the global media so heavily under American control, I mean, that basically filters through into all these other countries and, you know, shapes the reality of the people living there. So, for example, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, it would have been unthinkable for Sweden or Finland to, you know, adopt that sort of pro-NATO policy. I mean, really, Switzerland is almost a member of NATO, you know, is virtually a member of the West these days, which, it, you know, would have been neutral for a century or more. And, and so I, I really think probably the biggest factor is the media, including social media, including the internet, which, you know, has been totally dominated by the United States for most of the time since it's appeared. And that's obviously the reason there's so much concern over TikTok. I mean, TikTok is the first global internet platform that is not controlled by the United States. And that's obviously why they're trying to ban TikTok in the United States. Because, you know, when you think of it, the way TikTok has reshaped the ideological landscape in America is exactly the way Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube and all these other American-controlled platforms have reshaped the views of people in all these other countries around the world. And so, you know, I, I think really, I, I, I mean, I, I think the media is just an incredibly powerful force in terms of shaping people's ideas. And I, I think, for example, when you look at, here's an interesting point. Uh, you know, I obviously I listen quite frequently to uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, when he's interviewed on Andrew Napolitano and some of these other shows. And, you know, it's just been remarkable how dramatically he shifted ground in the last couple of years. In other words, for 30 or 35 years, he'd been one of the most prominent establishmentarian people you can imagine. One thing he was saying with regard to some of these developments is that he really thinks many of these very, very wealthy donors who are supporting Israel right now are probably totally ignorant of what's actually going on in Israel. In other words, you know, again, people sort of assume that the donors, these billionaires controlling Harvard, controlling Penn, controlling uh, Columbia, I mean, have some sort of inside view of what's really going on. I personally think many of them are just totally ignorant individuals whose views of the world are just as much shaped by the media and by some of these activists as everybody else. In other words, they're probably not much different than maybe your next door neighbor or something like that. And, you know, if your next door neighbor supports all these dramatic speech codes because he's been brainwashed by the media, I, I think much of that also applies to many of these powerful politicians or wealthy donors. And so it's sort of a closed loop where, in other words, you have these individuals all believing the same thing, even though it doesn't really have much reality. I mean, you know, take, for example, just one silly example. You know, early on in the Gaza crisis, there was that rid utterly ridiculous piece of atro atrocity propaganda about 40 beheaded Israeli babies. And it was plastered along all the media outlets. And I would really bet right now that maybe millions, even tens of millions of Americans still believe in that nonsense. And apparently that includes many elected officials. And I bet that includes even many of the donors who control the elected officials. So, I mean, you have basically an interlocking group of politicians, donors, activists, who all believe the same thing on these issues, even though doesn't really have that much reality. And that's why it sometimes takes a short, sharp shock to break that existing structure. And that's why I said, I mean, you know, if basically we, you know, if not for nuclear weapons, and if we challenged Russia too much, and they sent one of our carrier groups to the bottom of the ocean, and there wasn't anything we could do about it, I think that might be the sort of dramatic step that would really break through the false beliefs of many of these people. And, you know, cause some sort of popular uprising or revolution that, you know, would change a lot of things in society. But I, I, I think, in other words, I, I don't think, uh, I guess the final point, then I'll let you, you know, interject. I, I think basically the puppet masters of many of these individuals are just as brainwashed as the puppets themselves.
I, I think you have, you know, it's maybe a few of them know what's going on, but I think most of them basically get their information from exactly the same totally biased sources that so many of these ordinary people who support these ballot policies get their information from. Go ahead, Dr. Jones. You can pick up on that. And I had a, a little question that I wanted to ask based on a point you made before, but go ahead okay. if you want to pick up on Okay. On uh, Americans don't control the media. Jews control the media. We have to make this distinction. Now, I've, done, I've said this before. Uh, that you have to make a distinction between the Jews and all Jews. There's a distinction that we have to make. We have to be sophisticated here. The Jews. It goes all the way back to the Gospel of St. John. Hoy, you day hoy. This is a political entity. It has. It was run by a group called the Sanhedrin. That mobilized the Jewish people. Now, that doesn't mean that every Jew in Jerusalem said crucify him when Jesus Christ was on a cross. Okay? We have to make this distinction. The media is controlled by the Jews. It's now major Jewish organizations, not the Sanhedrin anymore, and so on and so forth. It is not controlled by Americans. If we're control Let's be specific about Americans. What do we mean by Americans? We mean uh, the rule of law in America. That does not control the Internet. If it did, we would all have First Amendment rights and we wouldn't be banned from platforms. So we have to be specific here. If we get lost in these generalities, uh, we are not going to be effective in dealing with a very serious crisis that this country is facing. This is an existential crisis. If these laws get passed, that's the end of America because America has nothing but at the First Amendment. We have no culture. Our infrastructure has been destroyed. Everything has been destroyed. The only thing we have right now is the ability to express ourselves in spite of huge opposition from one particular group of people. It's not Americans that can ruin your life. It's groups like Stop Anti-Semitism. These are the people that can ruin your life. It's not, uh, it's Roberta Kaplan. This is the lady that went after the, the white boys at uh, Charlottesville. This, she uh, has a law firm that specializes in ruining your life. This is the only group in this country that can do that. That's the heart of the problem. Well, I, you know, that might be going a little bit too far. In other words, certainly, I, I think there are a lot of other groups that would like to do something like that, but they don't have enough power to be as successful. I agree with you completely. <laughs> You're true. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so, you That's know, the issue. That, yeah. The issue is they have the power and no other group has the power. And so the question is, who gave these people the power to ruin your life? Who gave Alan Dershowitz the power to ruin your life? Well, uh, <laughs> well, they basically worked very hard for 30 or 40 years, and people didn't pay attention. I mean, you see, the problem, I, I think part of the problem is prior to the existence of the Internet, it was very difficult for people to get information on many of these issues. And so, you know, in a sense, in the 1960s or 1970s, you know, maybe you could get a newsletter here or there, maybe you could find an old book. But I mean, the media was very centrally dominant. It was three networks and then eventually four networks. And so that's what everybody knew about the world. And so in a situation like that, it, you know, it's much easier for small groups to sort of work very hard behind the scenes, capture one strategic point, capture another strategic point, build their power gradually, purge one enemy, purge another enemy, you know, that sort of thing, and then gradually build up their power to the point where they do sort of, you know, dominate the media and they dominate a lot of these, you know, legal groups. But, you know, I, I think with the rise of the internet now, it's much more difficult to keep that information out. And people are much more aware of these things. So, you know, I, I think in, you know, again, maybe, I mean, if they succeed in banning TikTok and if they succeed in pressuring Elon Musk into reestablishing a lot of the harsh censorship regime of the old Twitter and a few things like that, it could be they could reestablish much of their previous media control. But, you know, unless they can do that fairly quickly, I, I think the landscape is shifting so dramatically against them on some of these I, areas. I, I mean, with, 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 I, the Gaza, with the Gaza thing being the best example of that. I mean, you know, I the point I've made in some of my articles 
yeah, the, the point I've made in some of my articles is that, you know, when you look at, for example, Gaza, I mean, what, 30,000, 40,000, maybe even 50,000 Palestinians have died. But, I mean, the tremendous impact of that, hundreds of millions of people, even billions of people around the world, are paying attention to those issues where they weren't paying any attention seven months ago. And that's a tremendously powerful shift in global public opinion. And so, you know, once, for example, you know, that shift, if that shift continues and solidifies, I, I just think it'll be very, very hard for them to maintain their control. And, you know, the other point I made is that, you know, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I mean, there are many very controversial issues in the last 50 or 60 or 70 years of the world, that if the facts were more widely known, I think they would utterly destroy the power of some of these groups that you dislike and you know are, are harassing you right now. And with the internet, with the Gaza developments, I think it's much more likely that some of those facts will become known. And if they do become known, I, I think that means the collapse of this powerful regime that, you know, has taken decades to build itself up into being such a dominating force in our society. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Dr. I, I, I love your use of the passive voice here, but I, I have to <laughs> object that there are active agents out there and we have to confront them. So I, I also love your optimism, uh, but it's not going to happen all by itself. And I, I applaud your courage in having this platform. I thank you for having me on the platform. But we have to press forward here, okay? It's not over. It's not over yet. And so I, I think I, I'm trying to give you a, a more specific idea of what I'm proposing. Uh, I was involved in a battle over the statue of St. Louis in St. Louis. Got involved in that battle. And uh, the guy who was my opponent was a guy who called himself a Muslim. He was Umar Lee. Uh, he used to be a white boy. Uh, he's got a lot of different identities. And he was the front man for basically the, the lady rabbi who runs the most radical synagogue in, in, uh, in St. Louis. So I, I named her and I'm uh, engaging in a debate with, the, with the, uh, Umar Lee. And my friend in St. Louis gets a phone call. And it's from a Jew, friend of his. And the Jew says to him, oh, that rabbi, nobody takes her seriously. She's a complete lunatic. So he tells me this, and I said, okay, uh, I want you to get back to this guy and say, what we need to do right now to save the statue is to have Jews and Catholics sign a statement saying our, our allegiance is to St. Louis, the place where we live, and not to these radical groups, this radical rabbi, and so on and so forth. Well, the Jew disappeared at that point. He's not going to come out in public on a what is basically an American issue. And I'm saying that's going to have to happen. That's going to have to happen. I think it's already happening. I think that that Glazer statement it may be, I don't know whether it's a, it's a harbinger of something or it's so badly written, it's hard to understand what the guy's saying. But if it is a harbinger, we are going to have to unite as Americans. And we're going to have to say that certain things are un American. And one of the things that is un American is having some Jew ha have the ability to wreck your life because he doesn't like what you said. That is not American. And I think that. Jews should be able to join in on that. There's a lot of split now in the Jewish population. We should be able to unite politically around our identity, which is based on the First Amendment. Now, let me ask you this. You mentioned earlier, uh, you suggested the need for an anti, and maybe an anti the Jew party, the Jews, <laughs> not all Jews party, uh, but you, you mentioned uh, the need for something like that. Uh, between the two parties that we basically have in the U.S. now, and I'll ask Jones first, and then uh, Mr. Dr. Jones, and then Mr. Jones can pick it up too. Uh, on which side do you feel that there's more maneuverability, uh, at least among the elected officials, uh, uh, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party uh, in the United States? There is no maneuverability <laughs> okay let me let me give you the political situation if you're a, if All you're right. a if you're a democrat you will you you are against israel but you think it's okay to kill babies in the womb okay if you're a republican you support israel okay but you think it's okay to kill babies with f-16s <laughs> now i i want 
I want a consistent position here as my platform when I run for president, okay? It's wrong. It's the call of the fifth commandment. Thou shalt not kill. We have to have, there is only one basis for America, and that is uh, moral, the moral law. Acceptance, a moral consensus. John Adams said we have no, co we have no co constitution that functions in the absence of a moral people. Even Irving Kristol, when Samuel Huntington pushed him on the issue and asked him, well, what's the basis of America? He said, Judeo-Christian morality. In other words, an agreement on morality. Well, guess what? The Jews blew that up when Roe versus Wade got overturned, and they announced that 400 Jewish organizations announced that abortion is a fundamental Jewish value. So it's abortion to Zionism. That's the problem. It's a total repudiation of the moral foundation of civilization. That's the Jewish position. And we have to come up with the American position, which is our Constitution can only function with a moral people. Now, are you ready to join, Ron? Are you ready to? I'll make you vice. I'll make you vice president. All right, I'll make you vice president. <laughs> to be honest, I think you were a little bit overly optimistic in your characterization of the parties, because, for example, it's true that a lot of rank and file Democrats are very critical of Israel right now, but the party is totally controlled by the yes. pro-Israel donors. So, in other words, I, I think it would be very. I mean, you know, again, the the party, since so many of the rank and file Democrats are so unhappy about outrage of what's happening in Gaza. They're putting some pressure on the administration. But, you know, I, I think the still the strings are still in the hands of the pro-Israel billionaire donors. So in other words, it, you'd really see almost no difference in our Middle East policy between the Democrats and the Republicans. So, you know, I mean, basically the difference I think is the, um, the Republican Party the rank and file members, you know, are many times Christian Zionists and are pro-Israel for that reason while the leadership is controlled by the pro-Israel billionaires. In the Democratic Party, ordinary Democrats are much more critical of what's going on, but the party's still controlled by the pro-Israel billionaires. So, you know, it's a question of, I, I don't see that much difference between the two parties. In fact, one of the unfortunate things is, you know, I had sort of thought with Robert F. Kennedy running as a third party candidate, you know, I thought, well, I'll give him my vote or something like that. But yeah. what's shocking, is that you know once they yanked on a string, he became more pro-Israel than either of the other two candidates. So in other words, we have a situation where all of the three most prominent candidates running for the president see no daylight between each other on the Israel question of Israel and Gaza and the Palestinians. So you know I'm not saying I, I expect this thing will go on permanently, but. I mean, it's just a very disheartening situation. We're f facing a presidential election, and there's absolutely no choice. I mean, that's actually just what Jeff Sachs said the other day, that, you know, he'd sort of endorsed Kennedy. But, I mean, given Kennedy's position in the Middle East, I mean, he can't support him anymore. And, you know, if, if the interesting thing about it is if Kennedy simply took the position of being much more opposed to what the Israelis are doing in Gaza, I mean, that represents probably 30 or 40 percent of the American people. In a three-way race he'd do much better with that position. But he's still totally under the control of his very wealthy donors, presumably, who are, you know, probably Zionist billionaires. Yeah. I agree. He blew up his own campaign when, yeah. uh, exactly. when, when, when Rabbi Shmuley well, I was just going to say, play, Shmuley. Play, play, uh, play, play. He's the good cop. I'm the good oh cop. God. He's not uh, an anti-Semite. Kennedy grabs the Israeli flag and walks down Fifth yeah. Avenue waving the Israel. He blew up his campaign. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with that completely, and it had to be smoothly too. Um, also, I'm looking at this bill, um, so it appears to be more of like a groundwork type bill. Not so long, so I've been able to read the whole thing. Uh, but this is Section 8, Online Anti-Semitism, anti Holocaust Denial, and Distortion uh, in order to assess steps to counter the spread of anti-Semitism online not later than 180 days after the date of enactment of this act. And every, every year thereafter, for a period of 10 years, the National Coordinator to Counter Anti-Semitism in conjunction with the Interagency Task Force to Counter Anti-Semitism shall conduct a study and prepare a report that shall include each of the following. One, an analysis of the prevalence of online anti-Semitic content, including Holocaust denial and Holocaust distortion content. Two, 
two recommendations to Congress to counter the spread of anti-Semitism online, including options for greater transparency requirements relating to algorithmic systems, content moderations, enforcement of community standards, accountability for individuals, and accountability for online platforms. And then also there's another, uh, I'll just read real quick, Section 10, Holocaust Education uh, and Anti-Semitism Lessons, beginning no later than 180 days after this act. Uh, the Holocaust Mu uh, Memorial Museum shall conduct a study on Holocaust uh, education efforts in the states, local education agencies, and public elementary schools and secondary schools. And then it goes through a whole list, a uh, very thorough list, actually, uh, of things that might need to be done uh, towards uh, Holocaust education. And, and the whole bill's uh, got a bunch of stuff like that, but that was the a couple parts that jumped out uh, at me, and I can link the bill uh, in chat. If you can see chat there, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Ons and Dr. Jones, if you guys want it, uh, just in case to peruse later. But that was the bill that we were talking about earlier. Um, any any thoughts on those uh, provisions, uh, Mr. Ons or, or Jones? Either one, well, either one of you guys want to take it? I mean, you know, again, I, I don't know enough about the legal structure that, you know, it would be interesting to see some experts who really are, yeah. you know, much familiar with the legal issues go through it read it carefully and then you know it give seems me more like a groundwork type bill to me rather than like straight criminalization but it seems like leading to more recommendations to congress right what can we do after that it seems to be a little bit more like that but still some fairly uh scary i think you would say provisions in there but um uh, but yeah i'm not an expert uh, on it myself uh but dr jones any thoughts on some of what i read there out of the yeah book? yeah this this thing went from a from a, a recommendation that wasn't worth the paper it was written on in the first announcement there that just does not have the rule of law, it does not counter any rule, blah, 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 to now, well, it's going to be a law. So <laughs> that's a big step, isn't it? So uh, what's the next step going to be? That's that's the big issue. Of course, they're not going to you know break down your door tomorrow. Uh, but maybe the day after this is called, we used to call this salami. Yeah. So yeah, incremental salami tactics. You don't take the whole <laughs> salami. You take it a slice at a time. And that way it's, it's, uh, it's less painful or less, uh, or more difficult to fight. Um, now let me ask you about the future. Um, uh, you know, going against, uh, Zionist, I guess. What what is your future in that, and what do you think is the answer uh, for people to unite? Is there a chance to unite left and right uh, on this, um, or are we going to see it uh, demagogued one way or the other? Are you asking me? Yeah, and then uh, yeah, I've I've, I've already too. I've already stated my position. The traditional yeah. American position is that we have no constitution that functions in the absence of a moral law. We have to get back to the moral consensus that is known as the Ten Commandments. The main group that subverted this moral consensus is the Jews. Beginning with school prayer in 62, that was the AJC with Leo Pfeffer, the, the pornography. We have now uh, Rabbi Friedman, another rabbi. If, if, if these rabbis didn't exist, Hitler would have to invent them. Now we have Rabbi Friedman with an article in the Washington Post talking about how pornography is really a good idea and the jew this is a rabbi who says it's okay and he thinks that everybody's going to, oh okay must be okay what this guy did by endorsing pornography is he discredited his entire religion if that's your religion you have no place in the public square if your religion is killing gazans with f-16s and babies in abortion you have no position in the public square and we are going to have to unite as americans around this moral consensus because it's the only thing that will save us at this point uh and then just thoughts before i i, I let uh mr Unz pick up his final thoughts here too but um thoughts on the media's complicity uh in this do you see that continuing throughout 2024 um or is there going to be some type of ceasefire or some type of safe face for biden um as we head towards the election to you, Dr. Johnson, I'll let uh, Mr. Hans get his final thought. I don't think these people are in control of events. I think that there's an L. What happened with the exchange of missiles between Iran and Israel uh, was an attempt to prevent nuclear war. Whether the adults, who the adults in the room are, I don't know who they are. I, I, I was on a show with I was on a show with Michael Scheuer, a hero of mine, CIA guy who yeah. stood up to the Israel lobby a long time ago. And I said, are there any adults in the room at the CIA? And he said, no. Well, that was that was pretty depressing. <laughs> but uh, the course of events 
has a logic of his own, and I think the politicians are going to conform to the course of events rather than allowing taking control of it. All right, Mr. Unger, your final thoughts here on this on this discussion, and then just also uh, any predictions for 2024, um, what's going to happen with the elections, anything you want to throw in here uh, and tell people where to find you, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Jones do that too because I forgot to ask sure. him, but I'll let you go first, uh, Mr. Unger. Well, I mean, I, I think in many ways, and this is something I've been seeing for many years, but I think it's more and more apparent now. I mean, we're very much, I think, in the equivalent of the last stages of the decay of the Soviet Union. I mean, internal problems, social problems, economic problems, ideological problems, and, you know, faced with all these foreign policy disasters. In other words, you know, it's the sort of thing with uh, Chernenko, Brezhnev in his later years. I mean, that's basically the equivalent of, I think, Biden in the White House right now. So, you know, when you have a country that's really decaying away, becoming more and more incompetent, more and more, you know, ineffective, and with the people more and more dissatisfied, I think there's a high likelihood that the regime collapses at some point in the near future, especially if a short, sharp shock causes that collapse. And that's really what I meant by fragility. I mean, the danger is when the Soviet Union collapsed, it collapsed in a surprisingly peaceful way, more than probably anybody expected in the outside world. And in the case of the United States, I mean, maybe we'll be lucky in the same way and see sort of a peaceful collapse of the American regime. But I mean, given how crazy some of our leaders are, I mean, the reckless, dangerous things they've done, I mean, the Nord Stream pipeline, Ukraine, Gaza, you know, Iran, all this stuff. And with, you know, five or 6,000 nuclear warheads, it could be just a very dangerous situation. But I mean, basically the bottom line is I see us being very much analogous to the last stages of the Soviet Union prior to its collapse. And, you know, that, could be seen as a good thing, but you know, if it turns out the wrong way, it could be a disastrous thing for everybody. Oh, and in terms of my website, it's uh, uns.com, the uns review. And again, we have a mix of all these ideological issues and you know, all my writings are there as well. And thank you, sir, for taking the time tonight to, to be with us. And uh, Dr. Jones, tell us where to find you as well. And thank you as well, both you guys. I know this was highly anticipated uh, getting you guys together. So thank you both for your time this evening. Yeah, and thank you for having us on. It was a great a great discussion. Uh, you can find my, my books at fidelitypress.org or culturewars.com, where you can subscribe to ma the magazine Culture Wars. So the Jewish revolutionary spirit uh, is available at fidelitypress.org. Very good. Very good. Thank you both, gentlemen, uh, and hope to have you back soon. Have a good one. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Ron Unz and E. Michael Jones here live on the Kill Stream. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CAC of NoFair. Remember to like and subscribe.